Today, I'm going to take you through an exercise of thinking, or following a train of thought. We're going to explore several different information sources to see if we can create a larger picture of events from small fragments of information. I'm going to use mythological, religious, and archaeological data, and we're going to see if we can find out what happened in Sumeria in the Middle East. This region was heavily disputed and linked to several different cultures claiming ownership to the lands and the origin of man. It saw many wars and flood events. Was this naturally occurring due to the overpopulation as man expanded in the region? Or was there a greater force at work causing chaos? Let's start at the Gilgamesh floods. In 2700 BC, it is believed the region of Uruk flooded, causing migrants to flee to surrounding communities. This spawned off a handful of flood myths in the region. Since Sumeria was founded here, we'll start with their own flood myth as the beginning of our cross-mythology story. According to Gilgamesh's flood tablets, five great male gods, Anu, Enlil, Ninurta, Enugi, and A, were planning to flood Uruk, but were sworn to secrecy. A, or Sumerian Enki, told the plan to Utnapishtim, through a reed wall. He told him to build a boat to keep his peoples alive, and gave him dimensions and instructions on how to build it. Utnapishtim asked what he should tell his leaders and peoples. E told him that they were being exiled, they were not allowed to live in Enlil's domain, that he would go down the Apsu to live with A himself instead. A supposedly lived in Eridu on the freshwater marshes there. So Utnapishtim builds this boat, and he boards it with his family, his workmen, his animals, and all his wealth. When the storm gods marched their armies across the lands, they caused a lot of noise. In order to get his boat into the water, they pulled the dikes and flooded the city. The gods who ruled the city retreated to Anu's heaven, perhaps a fertility temple. Ishtar was shrieking, claiming she must have said something bad in the Hall of Gods to have her peoples destroyed this way. There was no water to drink. It was either stolen, contaminated by clay, or by salt from the sea. His boat landed on Mount Nemush. Utnapishtim sacrificed at a mountain ziggurat temple and told them his story. The great mother goddess serving there accepted an offering, a lapis lazuli necklace, for herself, and the rest of his goods and wealth was to be divided amongst the gods. She declared that Enlil was not to share in this offering because he caused the murdering of her children through his planning. When Enlil arrived, he wondered at how a survivor managed to make it there. Ninurta claimed it must have been A. A denied everything, telling them, well, Enlil chose a too severe punishment for the peoples. Enlil told the survivor and his wife that, I guess they're now gods. They were transported to the very mouth of the river to live. So what does this myth tell us? Well. It sounds like these men, five of them, purposely flooded Ishtar, or Inanna's city of Uruk, on the Euphrates. They declared that it belonged to Enlil because it was in his domain. It sounds like Anu, who was the god serving beside Ishtar, was possibly abandoned or participated in it as well. He was supposedly the great god of her city because the temple was named after him. So, a wealthy man was told to loot everything he could of the city and come down to Eridu. So, it looks like they were creating Eridu off the backs of the destruction of Uruk. Now, biblical accounts state that Eridu was built by Enoch, an exiled descendant of Cain. Cain had murdered his brother in jealousy over being granted a lesser role and lesser rewards than his brother. For this, his children were exiled from the farms they worked. They wandered the region as migrants. Eventually, his descendant Enoch was said to be favored by God. He was shown God's city 
and he was going to build his own version in its image. We know that Ishtar, or Inanna, was a fertility goddess in their region. Was she their mother, in effect? Were the peoples of Eridu trying to steal from her city to take the business away from her fertility temple? Did they recognize that was what was producing wealth in this city? Genesis of the Bible states that Enoch's descendant Noah changed the fertility rites. They went from allowing patrons of the temple one son or daughter to guaranteeing they'll give you three sons. This does sound a little bit like a competing marketing scheme. Give the clients promises that you'll give them something they want. It sounds like they're trying to attract peoples to come to this one specific temple. Now as the story goes, God decided in punishment to return the world to pre-creation state, meaning they were going to get rid of the fertility temples. He told Noah to build an ark 600 years after changing the fertility rites. So they lured all these men who wanted to overpopulate to the region. Then they were just going to open the floodgates like they did to Uruk and kill them all. So 150 days later, after Noah's ark left, the water subsided. The ark had rested on Mount Ararat in Asia Minor of Turkey. It took about a year before the earth was dry again. God agreed that Noah was now allowed to eat any living thing, but not his blood, and God would not try to destroy life again in a flood. It sounds like they were having resource problems around Eridu in Sumeria, that either the changes to the fertility rites is what caused the overpopulation, or they were trying to attract the overpopulators to this region to deal with the problem. Food was being allocated only to important peoples. They weren't allowed to eat things because there was rationing going on. Eridu was punished in the same way Uruk was. Perhaps this was a form of karma, or the same people just reusing the same plan. It sounds like Noah's Ark took him up the Tigris River towards Turkey. Now we'll take a look at the Vedic myth of Indra. Indra was the king of Devas who had killed a great evil, Vritra, who obstructed human prosperity and happiness. He was a member of a race of giants or titans who brought drought and starvation to the region. His name literally meant obstacle or blocker of waters. In the Bhagavata, it was a tall black giant with a red beard who appeared holding a trident dancing to make the earth shake. He opened his mouth and absorbed the light from the region. He had long sharp teeth and everybody ran in fear. He became the ruler of a region and ruled with violence and fear. He was eventually defeated using the bones of a sage. Now this man sounds like Akkadian storm god Adad. So we've got a deity who sounds like Poseidon. One of his titles was Earthshaker, and we know he carried a trident. Apparently he could also create springs with his trident. So we've got a man with some sort of magical staff who could change the flow of waters within the earth, being blamed for moving water away from their peoples. Only he wasn't a white man, he was a black man with a red beard. It's unclear of where Indra's people were living, we know black people were typically from Africa. White people with red hair were from predominantly European descent. So these peoples would have come together to form multicultural bloodlines in a region between all of them in the Middle East. So perhaps this story comes from Sumeria. Now Indra is a sky god. We know the storm gods were blamed for causing noise in the region. The Jains claim he was just a superhuman. He wasn't really a god. He just had special abilities. Supposedly he lived in a city called Sparga Loka, which might have meant Loki's heaven. Vritra was associated with Norse Jormungandr, which was Loki's son. The capital of this region was supposedly called Amaravati. It was supposedly built by the Vishvakarma, 
or architects of the devas. So he's inhabiting a city built by foreign workers. We might get more clues as to the location of this city from the name of Ritra's mother. Her name was Danu. In Irish mythology, the Tuatha du Danann were the peoples of the goddess Danu. They were a supernatural race who migrated to Ireland. Supposedly, they were fallen angels who did not side with God or the devil during a conflict. They were punished by being made to live on the earth and work farms of the gods. They were scholars of magic and the natural world. In Greek mythology, Titanomachy was a war in which the gods fought for control of the region. Oceanus was a titan who refused to fight for either side. His kingdom supposedly was on Crete and got assigned to Poseidon after the war. So perhaps the Tuatha were part of his peoples that fled this Poseidon-like fear demon all the way to the British Isles. Ireland was colonized, they think, in 3000 BC by the Celts. This was before the flood of Uruk, so perhaps they were already moving out of the region due to the conflicts that were arising. Brittany is a region of France just off the coast of the British Isles. It hosted the Celtic folks who left Britain during the Anglo-Saxon invasion. Their peoples have a myth about the city of Is. Supposedly this city was swallowed by the ocean. Dahut's father was the king who built his city for his daughter who loved the sea. The Corrigans were fairy dwarves, architects who were able to build things that no man could. Dikes were built with gates to open for ships during low tides. They had keys required to open them. The princess tamed sea dragons, which were essentially boats her people used to travel and find rare and exotic goods for trade. She made the city a wealthy trading hub. It was said her peoples were living in luxury and debauchery, refusing to aid the starving beggars from the surrounding regions. Her father was left alone, neglected in his chambers, and didn't partake in her wild parties. Nobody was offering to the gods anymore. It sounds like the city found a way to support itself. They weren't relying on a god patron to provide them resources, so they didn't feel obligated to support the children of these gods. During one of these parties, a man with a red beard seduces Dahut. He stole the keys that opened the dikes and tricked her to flood the city. A visiting saint came to warn the king to flee. They didn't want him to die with the rest of the city. When Dahut tried to flee with her father, she got knocked off the horse by the saint. Only the king survived, and Dahut became a mermaid who haunted the sea. From the Celtic perspective, there was an ancient city with dikes that was purposely opened to attack the peoples of Is. It was a woman-run city. Successful. It did not say if the peoples of Is were hurting anyone else in the region just that they were making money by exchanging goods, and they were reveling and partying in their happiness and success. But the beggars surrounding them did not feel that same way. They were looking upon them with jealousy. Were these beggars migrants from surrounding God's communities? Or were they children of Is? Did Is deserve to die because another god could not feed their peoples? Were they simply attacked because they were led by women? Did Dahut survive somehow? Was she Danu of Vedic and Irish mythology? Did their peoples just give up and leave the Sumerian region? In Syria, there was a city called Mari. It was built in 2900 BC and abandoned in 2600 BC. This would have been about a hundred years after Uruk flooded. It was taken by a storm god, Eter Mer, and they started warring with the nearby Phoenician kingdom called Ebla. Ebla was known, like Is, for being a trading hub. 
the name Mari was given to that city after the reign of the storm god. We don't know what the city was called before this. Perhaps it was is. Was Indra the sky god Itermer, known by another name in another culture? Was he defeating Poseidon and displacing Danu and Oceanus' children from Is or Mari? Were the Eblin Phoenicians really Celts? Now, early Britons who got displaced to Brittany called themselves Albions. Did they mean to say Eblins? Archaeological evidence for the city of Mari shows it contained four dams that blocked water from the Euphrates into the city. Mari had a central mound, but there was no temple or palace. It was an open-air park. It had surrounding this park residential houses. There was a storage warehouse. So it looks to me that the people of Mari weren't actually that wealthy, but they were happy with what they had. They were sharing and working together. The story probably spread that they had wealth to send migrants to attack them instead of the wealthy of the Sumerian cities that created them. After it was taken and rebuilt by the storm god, they added higher exterior walls with better rainwater drainage to collect, I guess, drinking waters. They built a palace temple that had a throne room, so it's very clear that they now had a seated king instead of a collection of women traders who worked together. Artifacts unearthed from the area show men in grass skirts sitting or standing with bald heads or short hair and beards. They had inlaid blue eyes of lapis lazuli, like the pendant given to the Sumerian mother goddess in Eridu. So it looks like either the storm god's people who claimed Mari or the Mari peoples left being ruled by him were likely red-haired and blue-eyed. Now, in the world, the highest distribution of red-haired people is not actually in the Celtic British Isles like you'd think. They're actually in Russia. If we look at the Y-chromosome DNA haplotype migration map, we can see that Russian fathers moved into Iran and India. They were pushed over the Zagros Mountains to the east, towards the Vedics, which told the story of Indra. Now these people were probably of Yemnian descent. Were these folks just one group of storm gods that were overpopulating this region, and were they scapegoating each other for their crimes? On every continent we have storm gods. On South America and in Asia, there are more storm gods than anywhere else in the world. Strangely enough, Africa didn't feel the need to have storm gods. Were they the ruling caste? Were they the overpopulators? Or were they just protected behind the Saharan desert? In the Minoan culture, there is a mural describing these events. There is a group of underground dwellers leaving an underground city in the Zagros Mountains. They are a multicultural group of people. On the male side, there is a command ship with three men seated up high on a throne-like area. Two of them wear gold masks. One of them has darker skin. Below him is seated nine men. One has dark, dark African skin, six have darker, ready skin, and two have lighter skin. There is a boat of women here. Their throne has a single black woman. Her throne depicts a snake or dragon-like motif. Below her, she sits women all in white from closest to her, farthest away, in darker to lighter skin. Is this a sign of racism? There were 13 women. Three white women at the end of the boat were segregated as if they were slaves. Now it looks to me like the biblical story was moved away from Eridu over to Jerusalem to hide the fact that they had a black mother and a red-skinned father that the folks in this region were attempting to blame the white peoples who they were conquering and pushing through with their overpopulation. 
may be biblical Mary, mother of God's son, who had no father, was a passive-aggressive attempt to remind you that the events occurred around Mari. For when the Christian peoples were ready to see the truth. Okay then, who were our overpopulating fathers? Well, the haplogroup chart says they were this J line. That these red-skinned or half-black men were producing Iranians, Iraqis, Jews, Turks, Greeks, and everyone else they were pushing through on their way towards Europe. Their lighter skin was the result of taking of white women from this region to produce more sons. There is sign of these massive overpopulation um, destructions all across Asia and the Middle East. In Ur and Egypt specifically, you'd see mass burials where when the ruler died, all their people had to die with them too because nobody wanted to feed or take care of them. Honestly, I don't know why archaeologists seem to think this is a sign of, you know, slaves being put to death. It's more of a sign of conquership. When you conquer someone else, you kill the other guy's people. You're not going to feed them. You want to feed your own. We can see the J line from either Iraq or Iran pushed into the Middle East. It pushed through Turkey. It pushed through Greece. Around the same time in Asia, on the Chengdu Plain, there is a Shu Kingdom, which had a mass burial site. In the burials, there's evidence of a gold mask, like the one depicted on the Minoans' wall. There's also evidence that these men were kneeling and facing towards Mecca. They buried a ton of tusks, and they scalped these turban men. Maybe these folks had an invading army of Sikhs and thought their hats were stupid too. So it's very clear whose fathers were doing the overpopulation. It was one of the Russian R1As pushing into Iran and India, or one of the J lines pushing north into Europe. Let's go back to our Noah landing story for the folks who were pushed out of Eridu by the Akkadians of Lower Egypt. Their ruler was Sargon. He was said to be the son of a gardener in Egypt. Apparently he walked out into the countryside and decided to just become a god ruler of another region. Noah moved up the Tigris and landed on Mount Ararat. Mount Judy, or Kudidagi, in the Zagros Mountains, sits just up the Tigris, and Tigris thinks that this was the place where Noah's Ark reached Turkey, after the Sumerians were punished with the Great Flood. The folks who inhabited this region were known as the Hurrian. It is believed they're the origin point of the Hittites and the Mitanni, who later married into influential families in Iraq and Iran. Mari supposedly subdued Urkesh, which was the capital of Huria. They worshipped a storm god called Teshub. I wonder if this is the god who called Noah to his land. It seems like he kicked a hornet's nest, which caused a lot of problems in this region. Now, if we look at the symbology for Teshub, he could create rivers and springs, kind of like Poseidon. He was depicted at Yazilakaya, which is Midas' throne in Anatolia, driving a chariot with two bulls. Next we'll look at the story of Moses. He was adopted by a pharaoh's daughter during a time when his peoples were overpopulating and they were trying to remove excess children. He was left exposed in nature to die, but was picked out of a river and given to this woman. A slave master was beating one of his peoples, and he got into a conflict and killed this man. He fled persecution across the Red Sea to a place called Midian. The gods there sent him back home to demand the release of his peoples. His people were led out of their home across the Red Sea to land at Mount Sinai. Now, several parts of the story are interesting and tie into other world mythology. The first is the name of the pharaoh's daughter, Thermothis. They claim she was an Egyptian serpent goddess, but her name actually sounds like the Greek titaness Themis. 
She was the daughter of Cronus, who was exiled after Titanomachy into the Underworld, which would have been around Hades, Asia Minor. The nearest oracle site in Asia Minor, which Themis would have been responsible for, was at Didyma and Miletus. They also had an altar of Poseidon here. Themis fostered Eros, son of Aphrodite. He was given to her because she feared he would never grow up. Does this mean he was a dwarf, sent to her for not being well formed? Eros was said to be a mischievous man-child, apparently with the powers to turn invisible, project imagery in the mind, and evoke lust in other peoples. He sounded like a male siren with mind control powers. Remember, we had that story in Vedic mythology of this crazy image of a storm god like Poseidon sucking the light out of the air. Was this event a projected illusion? Did Eros or one of his peoples scare Vedics into attacking other peoples? We know that during 1600 BC, the Thera volcanic events in the Mediterranean caused massive migrations around the area. The Minoans from Crete were taking land from Kos and Rhodes, pushing the Telchines over to the mainland in Asia Minor. Part of this region was Miletus. So the Telchines, they would not have liked Poseidon very much. He would have been an image of fear to them because he stole their land by force. Were these dwarves of the Telchin trying to use trickery to get folks to attack their own attackers? The next interesting point of Moses' story is where he went. Midian was across a Red Sea. In Anatolia, Turkey, there was a Gordian capital of Phrygia, whose famous golden king was Midas. Was Midian Midas's reign over Gordian? Just to the west of the city was a salt lake called Tazgulu. This lake turned red during the summer due to algal blooms. Did Moses, who might have been Eros or one of his people, come for help from a region to the west of this lake? Remember, Moses was said to be a slave of Egypt, and the people attacking Huria was the Akkadians, children of lower Egyptian men. Now, Moses was apparently leading his people out to this mountain refuge across a Red Sea. There is a large underground city called Darin Kuyu, which housed workers for the region of Asia Minor. They think about 60,000 people or animals could have resided underground there. This city was just across the lake from Gordian. Now, in Norse mythology, storm god Thor was known to pick on dwarves. He didn't want to let a dwarf Alvis marry his daughter, so he gave him an impassable test and disqualified him, killing him instead and turning him to stone. During Ragnarok, the dwarves were said to seal their doors, and Darren Kuyu absolutely has rolling stone doors. There's also the myth of Mimir. He was a Balkan who was Odin's maternal uncle. During the war with the Vanir, which was presumably the Hittites, they exchanged prisoners. In return for Njor and Freyr, Njor possibly being Noah and Freyr being possibly Apollo, they gave up Honir, who was a beautiful, large, attractive man, and Mimir, who was a wise man of their peoples. Honir was a yes man. They were fine with him, but they ended up beheading Mimir. Apparently his head was returned to Asgard. Now Mimir is also tied to the myth of where Odin lost his eye. He resided at a well down one of the roots of Yggdrasil, so down one of the foreign rivers. In return for his wisdom, he had to give up an eye. This is similar to the lobotomization graves in Ur's death pit in Acadia. But Odin survived, and he carried around Mimir's mummified head 
supposedly to remind him of what happened and provide wisdom. Where did this happen? Well, we know mummification was predominantly in Egypt. The Osiron was a temple built beside Seti I's burial and housed a always refilling water structure. So it looks like at this point, Egypt was what was being invaded. Seti I was around 1300-1200 BC, the same time all these death pits were popping up. His mummy had also been decapitated. Let's look back to Egypt. By 1300 BC, the peoples moving up through Sumeria towards Asia Minor were going back towards Upper Egypt, attacking Ramses II. Let's just stop for a second and remember that Ramses II is the pharaoh who took over after his father Seti I was beheaded. There's this hieroglyph of Ramses II. He's holding a trio of small peoples of different skin colors by their hair. They all look like dwarves. These folks were said to be living in Libya, Syria, and Nubia. This would have been the region the Akkadians and later Hittites were taking over. Now, were the dwarves being blamed for Eros or a dwarven trickster with the same abilities? Was Sumerian A actually a Greek Eros, or was his other name Enki referring to the Norse trickster Loki? It's very clear their problem was overpopulation, and the poorer folks were spreading outwards, attacking other communities. Was Loki running his own heaven or fertility temple somewhere? Was he breeding dwarves to excess because the dwarves were being rejected from other fertility temples? Were they trying to take over and create a taller child for their next life so they'd no longer be rejected? Remember Vedic Indra called Vitra out for diverting waters. We know the dikes were opened several times in at least three cities in Sumeria, causing massive flooding, destruction of crops, loss of life. Uruk flooded around 2700 BC to enrich A's Iridu. A storm god then subjected Mari away from Ebla in 2600 BC. The Akkadians started taking over Sumeria in 2300 BC, and they attacked Mari's floodgates to enrich Sargon's Akkad. Then Eridu flooded, sending Noah up the Tigris. Then Noah landed in Hurrian territory, which Marius then subjugated by 2000 BC. In 1800 BC, Sumaria was no more. It was completely under Akkadian rule. In 1750, the Hurrians declared themselves Hittites and started moving into Asia Minor. They took the Mitanni in 1330 BC, who took Assyria and tried to marry into Egyptian royalty. All this chaos was causing massive wars, migrations, and famine, probably sickness as well. It looks to me that whoever ruled over Acadia was slowly taking over one city or region at a time using the peoples claimed to take the next region. Eventually, in 1300 BC, Egyptians stopped the flow of progress. They had enough of this nonsense. They attacked the Hittites and took over quite a bit of the region, but eventually declared a peace treaty. This moved the majority of the Dorians into Greek territory. And we see the beginnings of the Ionian migration, splitting peoples between Asia Minor and Greece around 1300-1200 BC. Now, whoever this trickster was, he condemned his peoples into exile, slavery, and persecution for his crimes. He was impersonating folks, telling wild tales, and puppeting the destruction of several communities and kingdoms. Nobody wanted any of the peoples that were migrants from countries he impersonated or moved through. They didn't trust them anymore. It was too dangerous. They've been hurt so badly for over 1,500 years. 
If we step back and look at the region today, we can see it was devastated and completely desertified during these events. The increase in population would have increased the demand for food in the region. They would have converted the land into farms and removed the trees. This would have increased the demand for water to support the agricultural processes. Now, when water started disappearing, nothing would grow anymore, and there was no plant life to keep the land whole. The region used to be a wetland during the times of the melting ice age, but the region doesn't actually receive a lot of rainfall. So as soon as the ice caps in the Zagros Mountains were depleted of glaciers, their peoples would have no more waters. So the massive overpopulation in this region would have sped up this process of desertification. It would have created the fears associated with losing and not being able to find waters to drink or produce food, putting everyone under fear, terror, and war. Basically, everyone was trying to blame someone else for the disappearance of the water. They started with the women. They attacked Ishtar and Dahut cities first. One was a fertility goddess, and the other one was just a wealthier, happier, successful woman trader. Now, women created peoples, and they knew there were too many peoples, so perhaps women were accused of being their mothers responsible for caring for them. But you have to remember, the women were not the clients applying pressures on the fertility temples to produce sons. When they moved the women away from this region towards the Celtic lands, they were gone. The problem continued, though, with poorer women being captured and enslaved now outside the temples with less and less population controls. This would have increased the birth rates in this region. Then they started to blame the dwarves. Dwarves were the architects of these waterways and dams. Water was drying up, maybe they were stealing it or moving it. Some dwarves had magical illusionary powers and could manipulate folks. Maybe they were hiding the women in the water away for themselves, because there's certainly a lot of dwarves now. Then they blamed Moses' people and anyone of Hittite, Sumerian, or Akkadian descent, because these folks were the profiteers and people's hoarding what was left of the land, food, and water during the problem. They weren't sharing. They were creating excess peoples as migrants from their cities who were moving into other communities and destroying those regions who could not handle those peoples. Maybe the profiteering Hittite ruler or the Akkadian ruler owned the trickster that stole the water because they seemed to be successful and creating a lot of children. They must have resources to do that, right? They made rules that only their wealthy caste were allowed to have those resources and to create those children. The poor were the ones creating famine, dehydration, and poverty, but those poor were just their children. It was pretty obvious that none of the men in this region wanted to give up sex or having children and nobody seemed to agree on how to share the resources or decide on how to have less births in order to reduce the problem. They were using con artistry and violence to destroy excess population and take what they wanted from someone else if they didn't have it already. They were labeled as exiles and undesirables and basically hated by everyone that they were persecuting or sending migrants to. Now, because their peoples weren't trying to solve the problem, but making sure they themselves were taken care of by hurting someone else, they're basically the poster children for non-team players attacking the concept of community for profiteering and self-interest. They became demons, devils, and basically the, the face of evil, giving anyone of their racial descent a bad reputation. Nobody wanted poor or migrant peoples. They noticed the movement of peoples were spreading out through these regions from one city to the next with this same disease of lying, overpopulation, profiteering, and violence, 
They could see it moving from country to country, and they didn't want their country to be next. So they didn't want to be attacked for resources. This is how xenophobia and racism was born, from this fear. It was intended to protect them from this happening inside their own communities. At first, they saw women as another race. All men were men. Then they saw shorter dwarves as different from whole men. Then they started recognizing people had different skin colors. They were always attacking the minorities recognized as more successful than they were. Racism was originally used against folks who were recognized as causing the crimes. But now it was being weaponized by migrants using diversity rules to attack majority races and folks gatekeeping resources for their communities. They were impersonating um, local peoples to break down walls around those resources and move those outside the community back into their own peoples, starving the communities they were attacking. This was creating more racial hate and hate crimes towards themselves who were recognized as stealing those resources. Is this not exactly what we see today with migration and exactly why peoples are pushing back so hard against it? Is this why Moses was eventually led into Exodus, carrying stone carvings, reminding his peoples of the crimes and what the rules were? Did those people become criminals to survive this environment? Is that why they lost those stones the first chance they got? That they didn't want folks to remember what they were being accused of, of what his peoples became? Is this not the same thing that Cain did when he covered his mark indicating he was a murderer and should be shunned and denied resources? Was the problem genetic, perhaps? Was this a learned behavior of his peoples from the very beginning of Sumeria? Were the Jews dwarves? Or were they just persecuted cousins of the trickster clan that moved through the regions in the Middle East? These men are of DNA Y half-blood type group, J. Their fathers are primarily of Iraqi or Sumerian descent, more specifically the Akkadian men from Lower Egypt and Africa, led by Sargon who took Sumeria, who went on to become Hittites. Now, Jews were at this time essentially foreign peoples who had European physical features. They were the spies. Their fathers were migrant men, but they were having children with European women. They looked like the peoples of the countries they were invading. Were the Jewish hated for being a vector for these impersonators who bred themselves to look like foreigners? Was that the intent? Now, their peoples throughout history have had a reputation for overpopulating by having too many children for amassing wealth and racially appropriating for only Jewish peoples. They were at the center of several world wars, which caused a lot of death starting here in Sumeria. This is probably why folks across the globe have a strong aversion to Jewish peoples, and why nobody wanted to give them a home. Is their fear of these folks what causes anti-Semitism today? We can see the chain of their male lines moving from Lower Egypt to Samaria, to Ebla, to Mari, to Huria, to Assyria, then Asia Minor, and then back towards Upper Egypt before they were stopped. The men from Samaria producing many children and peoples married into ruling factions in Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. They claimed Scythian descent through their women and moved through Russia. They claimed India. They've been pushed to surround this region. We can see the European male line being shoved around is R1A, Russian origination. They came from that Yamnaya line. There are many theories as to how the R1A and R1B lines split. One suggests that they divided somewhere in Russia, up further north. Others say it was in Asia towards uh, Kazakhstan. 
we know that they were fighting an overpopulation war, and they were dealing with displacement away from Sumeria. The folks that moved into Asia obviously would become more Asian. The folks that moved into Europe maintained their racial state. The only thing that geneticists seem to agree on was that the R line originated in Siberia, near Lake Baikal that their peoples moved from there through Asia towards the Middle East, where they were occupying during the Sumerian overpopulation wars. This makes sense because the world supposedly flooded during the early Dryas period, which means sea levels rose so high they had to go to the only places where there were land, and the closest land was Turkey. So, why is it today that Celts and Western European countries are the ones being attacked by migrants today? They haven't conquered us yet? These people fled and tried to escape the chaos. I guess they keep getting sucked back in by other parties. Now, these two cultures, that J-Line and R1A line, were warring over the taking of Russian women and infiltration and destruction of Russian settlements. Was it systematic racism and propagandas from the trickster folks of Iraqi, Persian, or Jewish, or Russian descent attempting to shift blame to somebody else in the community? We see the J-Lines today occupy the Middle East. They claimed their originating region. The R1A fathers were pushed to the north and east. Islam and Byzantine empires appear to have carried the problem with them across the region and to other peoples. Now it's moving through India and South Asia as well as Africa with the Islamic religion. The slave trade carried the problem across the Americas through European profiteers coming from Spanish and French-owned African slaves. Now, Spain and southwest France were at one point occupied by Islam, peoples moving between Spain and France. We see Jewish and Russian folks today are still practicing identity theft, pretending they are Europeans to enter North America and Europe. We'll probably never know who was the original male line to blame, but we have an idea of who participated in the problem. It's interesting that everyone in the surrounding region kept mythological stories remembering what happened there, and by putting those stories together, we gain a greater understanding of our own history and the dangers of overpopulation, resource starvation, and migration. That there is danger in playing the blame game and believing a con artist. We can see what overpopulation does to a region. It creates war. So why do so many of our newer Middle Eastern sourced religions still today apply pressure to create children in their quest for sons? This is increasing the load on communities to use more and more resources they already know they don't have. Folks who did not quest for sons living around those peoples had increased pressures to keep their birth rates up to combat the poor migrant armies attacking them in larger and larger numbers. Overpopulation and starving the global community of resources became a way of life to keep your own community alive, pushing the world to destroy itself faster. Did these folks learn nothing of their experiences in Sumeria? Are they just committed to a way of life that attacks other communities? Are we all destined to serve under the patriarchal misogyny, that needing of wealth and sex and sons, just to fight each other until the end for that last set of resources? Honestly, I wonder if studying this and seeing the folly of men pushes me towards feminism and lesbianism. Would women have created a different world? I guess we'll never know. Men weren't going to allow that to happen, were they? Well. That's it for today's episode of The Musings of Rin. Until next time.